Got our director, Richard Yeller. So we're going to do a little um, panel. My name is Derek Savori. I'll be moderating a couple a little discussions. We've got a few questions and answers here with some, some of the guests from the film and some local guests. So I'll make a couple quick introductions here. So Richard Yellen is the director of Seeing Change, Birth of the Endless Summer, and many other films. Um, Dr. Nicole Wisman is an assistant professor of management at University of San Diego, co-director and co-founder of University of San Diego's Environmental Integration Lab. Dr. Pedram Shodai, Shodai, sorry, New York Times best-selling author and filmmaker, author of The Urban Monk and The Art of Stopping Time. And Haley Hagerstorm, uh, partnership director of Sustainable Surf and Sea Trees Program, protecting coastal ecosystems with a coral, planting of coral and mangroves. So welcome, thank you. So uh, I've seen this film a lot of times, and every time I watch it, it's still just as amazing, and it kind of gives you those, those good feelings of like, wow, there's really, there's really a chance. We can really do this if we come together. So, Richard, I want to start with you. What was the catalyst for the film? Like, how did this all come together? Well, I'd been doing some work with Sambazon, and uh, I'd been doing a lot of work on behalf of the oceans and uh, working on the board of Heal the Bay. And also I'd done some documentary work with Surfrider that was instrumental in the Martins Beach uh, opening. Uh, and I just was able to connect the dots with Sambazon on how we could tell a story that wasn't just about farming in the Amazon sustainably, but connecting those dots to the, the larger mission. And, um, and, and at that time, we were starting to see the effects of climate change firsthand. So Ryan Black's, Jeremy Black, excuse me, house burned down in Malibu. We were evacuated here in the canyon. You know, you're seeing the weather change, hurricanes, and uh, we're just thinking, well, you know, why are we doing this? Like, why are we making these efforts? Why are we trying to do things more sustainably? Or why are we trying to get the plastic out of the oceans? And it was dawned on us that it was really bigger than one story about one initiative, but it was really a story about all the people that are coming together to make a difference. So as we started going bigger with that story, you know, myself being a documentary filmmaker, I was looking for that bigger story, right? So they wanted to talk about, obviously, and it's an amazing story, the 20 years and the 2 million acres of rainforest that they had actually helped protect through their business model, which is an amazing story unto itself. But really, when you talk about these companies founded 20 years ago, they were doing it in a world where there was no support and they were just starting it out. So they actually helped each other. So as you dig deeper, you see that there's a connected point with companies like NubiT and Guayaki and uh, even so with Outer Known. And as you start looking at that story, you start seeing the ability to connect the dots through industry. And then you get to talk to Dr. Nicole Wisman, and what she's doing at University of San Diego, for example, with her environmental in integration lab. So just the process of digging into the story a little bit and then realizing what are the stakes. So uh, understanding the stakes that we're all up against and then starting to talk to everyone about some of these key issues and then seeing where it all connects. But also then looking at, and this is something I credit Samazon and Jeremy Black and Ryan Black too, it's really to, to tell that, that larger story that's not just about us, it's much bigger than us. And that's kind of where this idea, we want to talk about solutions. Because you can point blame and, and that's, everyone knows the problems exist and that paralyzes people. So when we start showing the ability to take the path and each take the path step by step down a certain path, then we can start solving these problems and then it empowers people. Dr. Dr. Shojay, you had a prominent voice here in the film and I want to know, why did you think a film like this was important? Um, what did you hope it would accomplish? What got you involved in it? Yeah. Um, I felt like we were uh, losing the propaganda war a long time ago. And um, when you turn on the TV, most of what you see uh, is sponsored by farmers, CPG companies, or people that have a stake in you know, keeping the status quo and things are going wrong. And so these types of films, I think, are incredibly important and relevant as much as we can to push the messaging out there for people to understand that at the end of the day is where you spend your money. At the end of the day, it's the choices you make that will make a difference. And so it, it, the, the problem seems so daunting that I just think that the media messaging needs to keep reinforcing that you can make a difference. And so these types of projects make me very happy. Happy to be a part. 
Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Dr. Wisman, you've been using this film, I know, in your curriculum at yeah. University of San Diego. So how are your students responding? Yeah, I think, I think it's really important. Students, they seem to be really worried about their future, right? There's a lot of uncertainty around artificial intelligence and climate change, and they need to be able to see what future is available to them and know how to get there. So I think through storytelling and through showing films like Seeding Change, it helps students create their own imagination around what's possible and also understand the problem, right? So, and I teach in a business school and business schools don't tend to speak about our food system, but that's a huge part of the climate crisis. Um, according to Project Drawdown, that's 22% of our global emissions and 34% of our global emissions if we think about the transportation, the storage of food, and we're wasting a ton of food at the same time, 30 to 40% of the food we produce. So when we have, we see these food businesses, um, think about regeneration, think about sustainability, and it's not sustainability light, it's thinking about sustainability in a deep way, thinking about our communities, thinking about regenerating our soil. It's really important and I, help, I think it helps students really develop their imagination around what's possible so they can innovate and become those social entrepreneurs. Yeah, and Haley, for you, when speaking of regeneration and building, rebuilding, what role does Sea Trees play? We saw you kind of pop up at the end of the screen there. How, did you, how do you see brands like the ones that are featured here really contributing to building back and, and to this whole movement? Yeah, so um, we helped calculate the film's carbon footprint, which was then compensated for with sea trees, so protecting coastal watershed and planting mangrove trees in two different parts of the world. And what's interesting about sea trees, which to us are these blue carbon coastal ecosystems, so mangroves, kelp, coral, seagrass, and coastal watersheds all around the world, these are about five to 10 times more effective at sequestering carbon. So they are super, super powerful, but obviously it's harder to plant trees in the ocean than it is on land. So they've been somewhat left out of the equation, um, but thankfully that's changing. And as the partnerships director, I work with the brands that actually support our mission. We have some incredible brand partners that plant sea trees all around the world, whether it's compensating for their carbon footprint or just doing active restoration. And it really gives me hope that these companies are like investing in these active restoration projects. Um, and supporting it, whether it's like a one-for-one -one model, where they're planting a sea tree for every product sold, or maybe it's a campaign around Earth Month or World Oceans Day, um, but they're really stepping up to the plate. And what I've seen in the two and a half years that I've been there is this huge shift in the types of companies that we're working with, where it started with these like more sustainably minded, the ones you would think of, right? And that's shifting a lot, and we're getting more into these mainstream brands that are like, oh, this is part of the solution. This is something we can do, and it's an easy story we can communicate to our consumers. Yeah, thanks for that. Go ahead, Richard. This is a good example of uh, how this film is an actual exercise in voting with your dollar, in starting down a sustainability path, and how it can just one idea and learning one more thing and taking one more step, it just is a process. And everyone, and you like to talk about this as well, Derek, in your work, um, and you can talk a little bit about that, but with regards to like doing work for with Sustainable Surf, the organization that works at Sea Trees and working on their eco board program and learning about sustainable surfboards and plant-based glassing. Um, and then when they start planting sea trees and doing offset, we start thinking about our travel on our film and like, what's our carbon? So knowing Dr. Kevin Wild and over at uh, Sustainable Surf, he's gonna be calculating our CO2 um, on the travel here. So if I'd made this movie a year or two before, maybe I wouldn't have been thinking that way, but you know, we, it's daunting because we, we don't feel like we can do it, but the minute you start taking steps, like every step is important. So that's a good example. Yeah. I want to open it up. I've got more questions for the panel, but does anybody have a question or did anything, did the film spark anything for you that anybody wants to share? Go ahead. Thank you. What's an easy way to figure out which companies are sustainable so we do put our dollars where we should? Mm. Anybody want to take that? That, is that? Well, so I work in sustain, corporate sustainability and I help, we help brands with anything from their footprinting, um, reporting, certification, benchmarking, storytelling, and I have a mug that I have that my students have given me because I do a lot of sustainability education as well, corporate training, and on it, it just says it depends because it really depends on what you're looking at. It's very hard, 
any company that says, we did it, we're sustainable, Rivian, for, for example, is all the great things, they're, they're gonna say, but we're missing it here, we're missing it here, we, nobody can do it all because we're, we're trying to dive deep into the supply chain from extraction to processing to manufacturing, human rights, itch, um, biodiversity impacts, emissions, waste, water, hazardous chemicals, so it's very complex. So I think look for good certifications, um, look for good, honest, transparent storytelling with them being honest and upfront saying, here's what we're doing, here's what we're measuring, here's where we're falling short, and it's a continuous journey. So if they've got a good list of, or a good record of good reports, good storytelling, that's a good start. Does anybody want to add anything to that? I just love that you said what we're not doing or where we're missing the mark, because to me, sustainability is this like never ending finish line. So the closer you get, the further it moves yeah. because we're always innovating and it's getting harder and harder to be truly sustainable. And at the end of the day, every product that we make, every product we touch and use has an impact. And so how do we lessen that impact and how do we do better? Even the Patagonians of the world have an impact. And so it's about finding those that are like striving for that never ending finish line that just keeps moving like the end of the rainbow. And that makes me think probably the, 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 the fewer sustainability words they're using is a good indication that they're more mature and they're understanding how much more there still is to be done. So the more that they're kind of painting the picture on it, it's like, uh, I don't know, be careful. Because the companies that are more mature are just going, hey, it is. The more you learn, the harder it gets. And the, as you said, the further the goal gets away. Dr. I, I also think that there's a, a tendency in the market, especially of like, you know, people who know these things who you know tend to beat up on companies that don't do everything perfectly and I, I personally disagree with that i think we applaud good deeds and influence people up into the right places so when a company is doing a good thing great um and we we move them up like guai key i think does a really good job They're, they still have waste right um rivian we had the first rivian suv in the country um, I was going to get a, a bumper sticker that said powered by dirty coal. My wife didn't let me, <laughs> right? Because yeah. I lived in Park City, Utah. That It was powered by coal. Like, we couldn't do solar. So it, you're moving in the right direction. And I think incrementally, as we do that, things get better. Yes, I agree. I will add this, too. I think it's about education and educating yourself. So one of the things I wanted to learn for to educate people in this film was how to connect the canopy in the rainforest to the canopy here in America. And this is something why we spoke with Dr. Pedram Shojai over here and we're so glad to have him, grateful, because that is his specialty. He knows exactly everything <laughs> in the rainforest that is important to this planet from medicine to how, why it's the lungs of the earth. So personally, it's an educational process, right? To yeah. learn these things. So start looking at uh, educating yourself on the products. And it, it, of course, like there are, there are no silver bullets, right? So it's all about learning. Richard, speaking of education, I, I think for you, I know you've told me, like many people who have watched the film, I know it was really transformational for you as you went through the process. So what has that journey been like since you started this project and how has it influenced the rest of your work? Well, I think that understanding that if there's a core mission at the center that you can bring people together and make change. So I've seen that with my other films, but this is a bigger nut to crack because we're talking about like the stakes here, the whole, the planet's health and the impact on, on every person and every, every country. So I think that really just that you can tackle these kind of subject matters. You know, uh, there's another filmmaker here, uh, grateful to have him here. David Messvin, who, you know, we've worked on uh, storytelling around the issues of race and, and things like, all of these things are connected. So tackle these big problems, you can tackle them. And you, with, if you come at it with that, that spirit of, hey, we can do this, then it unlocks the power, the potential of making big change. Yeah, yeah. interconnectedness is a word we use a lot in sustainability now. Dr. Shoje, I know you focus a lot on the individual on wellness, mindfulness, balance, focus, kind of one, becoming one's full self. Where does work like this or corporate sustainability, let's say, the job, your career, how does that fit in with your message or does it? Are they integrated? Yeah, I think, I think it's central and I think it's a disservice to people to say you can just go home and meditate off a crappy job or a toxic home. And so we have our skin, then we have our second skin, which is our home. And what we bring into our bodies does matter. It impacts our stress response system. It impacts 
our immune system. It impacts things that um, are well within the nexus of our control in our homes. Now you walk out the street and a diesel truck drives by, you're getting, you're getting some fumes, right? And so I think what came to me early in my career is you control for what you could control for in your own personal life, but then you don't sit there and think, man, my yoga sucks because I'm still stressed. You, go, you keep swimming upstream, right? Try to find the source of the problem. And, um, and if it's something bigger than you, then you get in a room with some friends, right? And, and, and so you, you might not be able to handle it all on your own, but you can, if your will is there, start to impact things, go to the legislator, city, you know, city, city hall's 20 steps away from here. Mm. What's the problem? Let's, let's go talk about it. And so you expand into the community, and that's, that's how we change things. Yeah. Dr. Wisman, how about for you? Does that kind of resonate with you with what you're hearing from your students? What are you hearing from students in terms of what they're looking for in work, work-life balance, and what kind of values are they searching for? Yeah, I think um, particularly Gen Z, they're really concerned about finding jobs and careers that align with their values, right? So we see companies um, changing their initiatives and their human resource practices to align better with Gen Z and recruit talent. And I think this is really important because it helps companies change when we demand more from companies. Um, I see them very concerned about the way they consume um, and consumerism in general. And I think that's kind of a contradiction in this generation where we see folks you know, buying a lot from Amazon and Timu and these large companies. Um, and kind of trying to keep up with the latest trends, but at the same time being very concerned about sustainability and you know, holding brands accountable. So I think that's something that this generation will really have to reconcile in both their, um, who they're, what companies are working for, how that change is gonna happen, and their consumption patterns. Yeah, we've got time for just a couple more. Um, back in the back, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And I wonder, and you spoke about Yes, it's a great question. It's a great point, and uh, actually something we had to struggle with during the making of the film was actually to find the representation we wanted, because it was incredibly challenging to find a woman of color in the executive level in the natural foods industry, which is like, it's horrifying. And actually after this project, I worked on a Jedi initiative with, with the One Step Closer Foundation to try to, it's an initiative to teach CEOs and these business leaders in the natural foods industries how they, they need to incorporate women into leadership positions and people of color into leadership positions so that they can actually solve this problem. And also, uh, there's, uh, there's profit there, right? Their businesses are not going to thrive if they're not selling to the market that is there. So the food deserts and some of these things that we, we tackle in, in the film, you know, these are huge issues that like the people in the film haven't even addressed yet, which is amazing. So I'm glad you bring that up. And I think that's something that can't stress enough that we need to, uh, and it's just simply economics. And that's what amazes me too. Like it doesn't even, it's not political. It's not, um, it's not even ethical in a way. It's like, it's more profitable. It, there's simply an economic uh, reason for it. But I mean, we all as humans, I believe why it's not political for me is that we all want the clean ocean. We all want the forests. We all want to help someone when there's an accident. So there's a basic human nature there. So that's kind of our goal, I think, is in connecting that and touching everyone that way. Yeah, a great question. Anybody want to add to that? Yeah, um, I'll add to that. So this is a whole area of research, right? At asking the question, why? Why don't we see um, women and people of color and other underrepresented groups as founders of these large companies? And one answer is, is uh, the access to capital and the types of companies they found and the types of questions they're even asked by funders, right? So how are you going to prove that your company is um, going to be sustainable financially over the long term? Um, so I think it's really important to kind of reassess kind of gatekeeping um, and train folks to learn how to raise capital and learn how to build these companies and create these kind of um, networks that help foster um, uh, a more diverse um, entrepreneur. Yeah. I know the, go ahead here and then I'll get you in the back. Go ahead. I just wanted to say that I think that the 
say I think Richard did a wonderful job of taking a very complex concept and really identifying common areas of ground for every person, whether you live like this or not already, which in general we do. And I think that a lot of these questions, it would be so nice to have a community. As an example, when, you, when we first started buying organic things for everything 20 years ago, you go to our farmer's market as a perfect example, and many of them grow organically, but they can't afford the certification, so they don't use pesticides. And then you decide, do I buy organically from someone who comes from farther away, or do I buy something that was grown organically from a local farmer? And I think all of those conversations are really important, so it's nice to have a community of people that can discuss that and the pluses and the minuses and the pros and the cons, and I think it's a beautiful thing that you did. Thank you. Yeah, I agree, and I, want the, I think that's the goal, is to get as many people to see this film as possible, and just to think about this idea of voting with your dollar and how much impact we have when we go out and shop and support the brands and doing the things that, we, that we're looking for. How about back and back? Thank you, Richard. Excellent film. Thank you, Mitch. I would love to share it with family and friends. Can it be streamed? Yes. Oh, good question. YouTube? It's right on YouTube, right? Yeah, it should be on YouTube. Yeah, go to Seating Change, seating change Film. YouTube? It's right on YouTube, right? Yeah, it should be on YouTube. Yeah, go to seating change, seatingchangefilm.com and you'll find different ways to watch it all there. However you prefer to watch it, whether it's Amazon or YouTube. Yeah. Amazon without commercials, YouTube with commercials. <laughs> Post a screening at your house. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. Following on this one, you said earlier, I think that it's easy to kind of find very, very amazing insights to some extent. Yeah. It's going to take a bit of work. Was there any sort of momentum for us to get towards a sustainability score or metric or something like we see with CO2 emissions that would help to help to do it, that we do, that we do, that we do, that we do, but to pick up a clothing, to come back to that labor and see some number of other things, oh, it's not going to say that on sustainability, which represents a lot. It might be difficult to manage it if corporations want to do that, but is there any drive to come? I can say real quickly because I come from sustainability in the apparel industry and in the textile industry. We've been working on that for years. There's a scoring system called the HIG and it, it addresses facilities and brands. It is so hard though, back to that idea of it depends, like how do you know, first of all, we don't do a good job, we don't have good traceability in our supply chains. Uh, first of all, anybody that we identify that is in our supply chains, they're not doing any measuring, there's no accountability, so it is just this wide open mess, so it's very hard to pinpoint and put a score on it, because then you start to unravel, and there are just so many components that you should be measuring. So they, there is a scoring system, but they're very um, wary of making it public facing. So internally on the inside, the industry is scoring itself and keeping track of it, but the, getting it to the consumer is really complex. Is there any sort of body, etc., that has a website out there that you can type in the name of the company and based on your own feedback of what you know provided? I mean, it could get good on you is one. Good, um, I know that one. There's good on you and a few others that have kind of popped up. Does anybody else know of a place where you go to find the best uh, the brands that you know are doing well? Uh, we we find Made Safe to be pretty good for like cosmetics and brands. It's they they look at sixty five hundred known or suspected chemicals and they go through a third party vetting system. Uh, it's hard, right? If you pay to play, then suddenly the rules get a little slack. So you know, there's a few of them that I think do well. Made Safe's one. Yeah, and to that point, that idea of paying to play. I mean, if, even if you go and say, hey, we assessed something. Was it self-verified? Did you bring in a third party to audit it and verify it? So it just gets super complex, very slow, very cumbersome, very expensive. So, but it's a great question. I know we don't, we probably don't. Website too. Oh, good, on the seating change website? For that reason. And one of the things we did want to give more tools mm -hmm. uh, to people who watch the film, that's just the idea of having on the website. So there are resources there, but not as much as we would hope. Like for example, there is a barcode reader where you could actually scan barcode. Um, we were able to implement that, and I don't think it's quite ready, but there is something that exists. There's that a barcode sure. reader for this purpose, where you could actually go to the store and boom, barcode read and get the, the feed, feedback on that product. Yeah. And, and that is like where we need to be, and that's what we wanted to have ready when we had the film ready, like having our own, having our own barcode reader. I feel like that's a, a next documentary. 
Haley, I've got one more question for you because you're constantly checking in with, pitching, partnering with brands and companies. Are enough of them out there thinking the way that these companies in the film are? Do you feel? I think these are shiny examples. Um, I wish I could say all my brand partners are that amazing, but there is a shift happening that I see, a really positive shift in, like I said, the evolution of the brands that we're working with that aren't the usual suspects that are starting to come to the table. And I think we were speaking earlier about, um, you know, we're not just looking for the perfect ones, we're looking for the ones that are making progress and can we help them with that progress along the way. So we have a vetting process, of course, but they don't have to check every box for us to want to work with them because I think we can help shift them from the inside and by partnering with them. Yeah, great, thank you. My, uh, my last question, I'm gonna wrap up here with this, is there's a vision I think that's presented in the film that I think ends with a really optimistic place. I think it gets to this point where we start off with a little bit of doom and gloom. By the end, you're like, you know what? Like I said, we can, we, we can do this. So my question for each of you maybe is, is that optimism real? Do you feel it? And what's it going to take to get there? So maybe if we can end with a comment from uh, each of you. Who wants to go first? Yeah, I'll start down there with Haley. I don't think I would get up and do the work that I did every day <laughs> if I didn't feel somewhat optimistic. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really important when we are overwhelmed because there is so many complex issues as we saw in the film to like find those little, those positive spots, those hope spots as you know, Sylvia Earle calls them, like these places and these people that are doing these incredible things, these companies that are changing the game and like focusing on that because it can get so overwhelming looking at the bad stuff. So find the good stuff, channel into that, find communities of people, find organizations that get involved with and vote with your dollars. Good advice, yeah. Dr. Shoji? I mean, my optimism fluxes with what I had for lunch, really. Like, <laughs> it's really, it's, it's tough, right? There's a lot of bad news out there as a barrage. But, you know, I, I truly believe in the, the, the wolf that, that grows the one you feed. And so if you keep your eyes on this, if you surround yourself with people that are doing the right thing, um, and not, not so much make an echo chamber for, of your life, but continue to get you know, data points in saying, yes, this is good, yes, this is working, yes, I'm doing the right thing. Other people see you and see a possibility, mm -hmm. right? If you can't be the flame torch, like the, the flame holder, then that flame's not gonna spread. And so for us, we have to get up every day. You know, I get up and do my qigong and my yoga and all my stuff so that I could have enough enthusiasm and optimism to stay the course, right? And for people who are in this industry, it's exhausting sometimes, right? Because there's a lot of bad stuff out there. You have to stay the course because it's the right thing to do. And at the end of the day, we're doing it for the kids. Yeah, thanks. Dr. Wisman? I um, also share that cautious optimism that needs to be regenerated every day. Um, but it's, all we have is to be optimistic because the alternative is to do nothing and continue on the trajectory that we're on. And that's just not an option for me. And I don't think it's an option for young folks who are going to inherit um, this climate situation. So we have to be optimistic. We have to move forward. It gets very frustrating with you know incremental change. Um, I think we need to move much more quickly and scale. And I think you know these stories are really good examples of how to do this. So um, I'm going to try and remain optimistic. Move quickly and scale. I like yeah. that. Yeah, the youth uh, are really the most inspirational part of the work in that film. So getting to see the energy, passion, sense of urgency from the youth, from the students, we, tr we were like, do we, should we cut that section down? <laughs> and we ended up leaving all the students, grant winners in the film, just they're so, they're just uh, amazing, right? So they're, they're the ones, they're feeling the pressure that they're, they're like working on these solutions. They're so on it, they're very inspirational. So I found my inspirational in that next generation and how much more when you dive into the work around like conscious consumerism, the youth are correct, are really doing their homework on the brands and they're really gonna, they're not, they're not gonna stand for the greenwashing. So that there's definitely like a hopeful nature to that, I think looking to the next generation, but can we scale fast enough? And that's one of the things that like these like, the frustration or the kind of the, the scary side is that people aren't feeling the sense of urgency. Um, and there was also criticism ab about this film is capitalism the answer? Like, because that's the only focus we have because we feel like that is like the fastest way we can solve problems is with our dollars. 
voting with our dollars in a capitalist structure, but are there other ways of, is there pressure that can come from other, you know, other places, you know, do we need to, you know, look at policy as well and things like that on how we can make change and force some of these bad actors to really regulate and change. I always think of this as like a soundboard, like at a concert. So this is one dial, right? You've got all these dials and buttons that you can push. So you're turning one over here on capitalism, turn another one over here on nonprofits, turn another one over here on finance and the capital market. So any other questions from anybody? I think this idea of the future is really good. I mean, how we define sustainability is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And I think that's exactly what we're saying here is we, let's do what we need to do now, but not at the expense of our future generations. And I will say this, that what I have learned through making this film and then continuing on my own journey of trying to take more steps toward living more sustainably, that's very fulfilling. So you start thinking about, well, maybe I'll buy that shirt and I won't buy 10 shirts. And maybe I'll buy that shirt that has, that's made of recycled carpets. And if I have that electric car, I might think about solar panels. And you start thinking this way and you start doing it and it's actually quite fulfilling. And you start feeling that empowerment. And I think that's sort of, if people can start taking these small steps, because it's not, a, you don't have to take the big steps, you don't have to solve it all at once. And so once you start taking those steps, it's quite empowering, so.